Good morning, everybody. How are we doing this morning? We want to give a quick welcome to our musicians who we didn't get a chance to say hey to yesterday. First, we have Francisco, who is a cultural worker, a theologian, a singer-songwriter, and a campus minister. He's been here throughout a ton of the history of uh, the Ignatian family teaching, and he's always helped to unite us in song, and we're excited to have him again with us this weekend. This year, he's also joined by two of the peace poets, Luaya and Lumi. The peace poets have worked for racial justice, immigration rights, indigenous and environmental justice groups to develop music as part of their political practice. This is the Peace Poets' second year at the teaching, and we are thrilled to have them back. Okay, and now we'll do our final roll call. Ready? Bishop O'Dowd High School. Boston College. Caldwell University. Cheveris? Cheveris. Huh? Mm -hmm. Cheveris High School. Church of St. Ignatius Loyola, New York City. We did this one. I said that one. Creighton Preparatory School. Low energy today. Cristo Rey, Milwaukee. Cristo Rey Philadelphia High School. Gonzaga College High School. Gonzaga University. Jesuit College Prep Dallas. <laughs> Jesuit High School of New Orleans. Lemoyne College. Loyola School. Officina High School. St. Peter's Prep. Scranton Prep. St. Andrew Nativity School, Cristo Rey. St. Ignatius College Prep, Chicago. St. John's Prep. St. Xavier High School. Stone Ridge School of the Sacred Heart. University of Detroit Mercy. Colegio San Ignacio. Archbishop Mitty, San Jose. Homeboy. Homeboy. All right, thanks for that. Two real quick announcements and then we're gonna turn the mic over here. First one, find your seats. Don't save seats. Second one, if you have lost anything, please check in at the information desk, especially if you are missing a ring, check in with Elizabeth at the information desk. Did we miss anyone announcement? Nope, we're good. Okay. Turn it over. Right? Where are we? Uh, yeah, opening prayer. So let's hear from some of our sponsors. All right, so now we'll hear from the Peace Poets and then some content from our sponsors. When I say people, you say power, people, power. people. Power. When I say we want, y'all say justice, we want, justice. we want, justice. 
When I say we are, you say rising. We are. Rising. We are. Rising. When I say we are, y'all say beautiful. We are. Beautiful. We are. Beautiful. I say peace to the poets who, who propagate, propagate peace. From the west side, baby, down south to the east. Rocking hard for your pops, moms, nephew, nephew and niece. Doing this out of love because war is a beast. I say peace to the poets behind bars like a convict. People thinking peace is an absence, absence of conflict. conflict. It's really the ability to cope with it, to deal with it, to cry with it, to, to hope, hope with it. it. We spit for all ages, grad, grad school, school to third, third graders, graders, in a mosque, in a church, from baptism to satyrs. We spit to uplift the gift that, that God, God gave us. us, the power of the word, because we heard it might save us. So we say peace to the poets who, who propagate, propagate peace. peace. And power to the people who, who march in these streets. streets. And word to the workers who walk in bare feet. And light to the writers who fight to get free. I see me in you, and you in me. In the streets of Cochabamba, take back your life. We're rocking San Denis to parties when we took Managua. I shook my fist in Nueva York, and it no a la guerra. Environmentalists to protect la tierra. And I'm a feminist, yo respeto mi madre. Soy padre y bebé, the struggle of every day. Abuelita y hijita, soy la gente que grita. El pueblo unido jamás será vencido. El pueblo unido jamás será vencido. I'm the people united and I will never be divided. I'm the people who riot and I will never, never be, be quiet. quiet. I'm the ones who rebel, stuck, stuck in, in a cell. cell. I'm the people who see we, we are, are not yet free. Because I am the people, and, and the, the people, people are me. me. Peace. Peace. Good morning, welcome back. Can, can you do me a favor? If you, if you have an open seat, If you have a seat that you know is open, raise your hand. Raise your hand. So if you're looking for a seat, look at these great new friends you can make. Go find a friend. All right, keep that hand up for a second. Wave your hand super high. There you go. See all those seats? It's all going to work out. It's all going to work out. All right, now remember yesterday when I had you open your program book to the last page, and I, and I, um, told you about those great sponsors. All right, we're gonna hear from some of those sponsors right now. Are we back on? Cool. <laughs> we're gonna hear from some of those sponsors right now, okay? So I want you to be, listen really carefully, take in their story, all right? So first up is Hallie Douglas, Madeline Infantine, and Liz Turnwald from the Boston College School of Theology and Ministry. Here we go. Good morning, Teachin. We are current graduate students from the Boston College School of Theology and Ministry, and we are excited to join our Ignatian family in the pursuit of justice. My name is Hallie, and I'm a 2018 graduate from the College of St. Benedict, St. John's University, where I spent my last year teaching high school, hoping to educate my students on faith, justice, and the pursuit of right relationships. But I knew I needed a strong education, one rich in mission and community. I was drawn to the STM because I wanted more than just a classroom. I wanted a community that was motivated to share their faith and challenged to go further. Hi everyone, I'm Liz. I studied music, Spanish, and women's and gender studies at the University of Dayton. After graduation, I served with the Jesuit Volunteer Corps in New York City working at an interfaith peace-building nonprofit, and after witnessing the role that faith can play in sustaining peace, I felt called to pursue justice within the Catholic Church as well. I chose the STM because of its holistic approach to study. As a community of learners, practitioners, and believers, we challenge one another to pursue justice in the church, both in and beyond the classroom. Hi everyone, my name is Madeline. I studied English and theology at Notre Dame. While teaching creative writing after graduation, I saw firsthand how our creativity and our imagination can help us envision and advocate for justice and peace in our world. 
Now at the STM, I'm so glad to be a part of a community that's teaching me to grow to become more loving, hopeful, and creative every day. If you haven't stopped by our table, please come say hi. And to all of our alumni and current students, IREPM, Weston Jesuit, and BCSTM, come um, to the back of the ballroom to take a picture with us at the 1010 break. Let's hear it for BCSTM, great. All right, now we're gonna welcome Sarah Wachinski and Brittany Wilms from the National Catholic Reporter. Let's give them a round of applause. Morning, everybody. My name is Sarah Wachinski. I'm the Director of Audience Engagement at National Catholic Reporter. And I'm Brittany Wilmus, Engagement Editor. We're excited to be with you. We're really happy today to tell you about some of our products. National Catholic Reporter publishes an online and a, a bi-weekly newspaper, an independent source of Catholic news. We also have a terrific website called Global Sisters Report that talks about all the wonderful things that sisters are doing around the world. This weekend, we're also here to introduce you to Earthbeat, which is our newest reporting project. It's a website that focuses on faith-based faith actions in response to climate crisis. Um, we'd ask you to come by our table and say hi, or join us this afternoon um, for staff writer Brian Rowey's presentation on five things that Catholics are doing to fight climate change and how you can help. We'd love it if you check out EarthBeat at ncronline.org slash EarthBeat, or follow us on social media at EarthBeatNCR. Thanks. All right, thanks. Thanks, Sarah and Brittany. Thank you for that. And now we're going to see a short video message from our friends at Sojourners. Do black lives matter to white Christians? Because even though we agree on Jesus, we seem divided about his children. 72% of white Christians don't agree that there's a pattern of violence against black men. But 82% of black Christians believe the opposite. So why are our perspectives so different? How can a government choke a man to death for selling cigarettes, or imprison a woman for failing to signal, or kill a child in the park and not be held accountable? These are the ones on camera, but what about the countless others that aren't? If we keep saying these moments are isolated, what are we saying about our black brothers and sisters? That they're liars? That we don't believe them? It's time for white Christians to start listening. How many more isolated incidents will it take before we all see the pattern? It's time for white Christians to start acting more Christian than white. Join the conversation. All right. Thank you, Sojourners. And now let's There's welcome. There's the deadliest. Whoa. All right. We're rocking now. Let's welcome uh, from the Jesuit Volunteer Corps, Tom Chabot, the president of the Jesuit Volunteer Corps. And I think he's got some friends that are coming up as well. Yeah, come on up. Brianna Ledsom, and I'm a current Jesuit volunteer. Beside me are all of my fellow Jesuit volunteers and JVC President Tom Shaboya. We would love to invite you to our luncheon that's happening this afternoon, as well as to visit the JVC booth so we could tell you all about the transformative experiences we're having this year and so we can get a chance to meet you. Thank you all. Good morning. 
All right, thank you, JBC. Let's hear it for them. They win the award for most people on stage for their, their chance. That's, we'll be passing out the medals. We're gonna have to get extra medals, I guess, you know? Yeah. All right, and now I'm gonna invite up uh, Father Michael Rossman uh, of the Society of Jesus and Sister Erin McDonald of the Congregation of St. Joseph. Good morning, T10. As Chris said, my name is Father Michael Rossman. I'm a Jesuit priest in Chicago. Good morning. I'm Sister Erin McDonald. I'm a Sister of St. Joseph at Detroit Mercy. And the Sisters of St. Joseph were founded by a Jesuit. We want to invite you to three things. Just after lunch in the breakout session time, I'll be leading a discussion of how to make good decisions entitled The Call to Discernment in Troubled Times. I'll be upstairs. Next, last night we saw the witness of Jesuits and religious women who have given their very lives around the world. And our church and our world are hungry today for other sisters, brothers, and priests to similarly give their lives in religious service. I want to invite you to all of that. And we would like to invite you to a luncheon today at 1130 upstairs in the McLean room if you would like to have an opportunity to learn more about religious life. Thanks so much. Thank you. Good morning. When the Jesuit Superior General, Father Arturo Sosa, announced the four universal apostolic preferences for the Society of Jesus on February 19th, 2019, many individuals were elated that the environment and care for our common home sat in the same space as the three other universal apostolic preferences. The spiritual exercises and discernment, walking with those on the margins, and accompaniment of young people for a hope-filled future. All hallmarks, if you will, of Jesuit spirituality and education as expressed in our Catholic Jesuit values at our institutions, churches, and schools. Care for a common home as expressed in the universal apostolic preferences aligns to Pope Francis's desire for ecological conversion and steadfast vigilance for the poor as expressed in Laudato Si. What inspires radical hope with care for our common home is that we, us in this room, become the epicenter for action and orientation towards something bigger than ourselves, to Mother Earth and all of creation, and especially those made most vulnerable by environmental degradation. This, my friends, is an awesome responsibility and bestowed upon us by God as we recall the words from the first chapter of Genesis. Then God said, let us make human beings in our image after our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea the birds of the air, the tame animals, all the wild animals, and all the creatures that crawl on the earth. God created humankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them. God blessed them and God said to them, be fertile 
and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, and all the living things that crawl on the earth. Dominion does not mean ownership of or material use for my benefit. Dominion is not transactional, but relational. We are vested by God to serve as stewards for creation, to care for all of creation, to champion creation as a gift, along with and for our brothers and sisters of all faiths. But the challenge we are confronted with in our current global reality is what we as a global society have co-created. A social and environmental crisis, a throwaway culture based on our consumerism, exploitation of human beings and resources driven by our patterns of consumption, perilous living conditions because of climate change, an obsessive connection to technology and not a connection to the dignity of the human person. As noted in the UN's Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and the Fifth Assessment Re Report, our common good hangs in tenuous balance. Yet our collective radical actions of hope and love can procure and nurture the greenest vineyards with just paid laborers. But lack of action now will overtill the fertile ground where no one labors for the good of creation. God tasked us directly with minds to think, hands to serve, and technology to innovate so we can tend to Mother Earth and to one another now as co-creators. And the opportunity for us today in our common prayer is to elevate seeing God in all things and all people. Good morning, dear Ignatian family. I am Cesar Musiotti, I am a Venezuelan Jesuit, and I'm completing my master's program in educational leadership and policy at Boston College. As we gather here, things continue to happen that express the dignity and commitment of the human being to make this world more, more like the kingdom that Jesus proclaimed. But on the other hand, there are still wars, persecution, poverty, and forced migration. On my continent, South America, several countries have been going through situations of social political upheaval. In the church, we have just celebrated the Synod of the Amazon for a church that is more synodal, which means better in equity between men and women as leaders in every place where the church has a mission. This Synod was held while the Amazon continues to be destroyed by fires, and illegal mining. But what is the Amazonia? You know, sometimes I like to pray thinking that God is giving me some numbers about the, his creation. The Amazon is the largest tropical forest on the planet with an area of 5.5 million square kilometers. The Amazon basin covers 7.4 million square kilometers and almost 40% of Latin America. Nine countries are located in the area. Bolivia, Brazil, Colombia, Ecuador, the Guyanas, Peru, Suriname, and Venezuela. The Amazon rainforest, of which 2.1 million square kilometers are protected areas and national parks, is home to a biodiverse century unique in the world. A quarter of the Earth species are found there, including 30,000 types of plants, 2,000 species of fish, 1,500 species of birds, 500 species of mammals, 550 species of reptiles, and 2.5 million species 
of insects. But the Amazon also contains one third of the world's primary forests, and through the Amazon River and its tributaries, provides 20% of the Earth's unfrozen fresh water that we'll need to live. The Amazon is the largest river, river in the world, and also the longest, according to the last data. This jungle acts as a carbon sink, absorbing more CO2 than it emits and releasing oxygen, which helps regulate global warming, as we know. But deforestation is reducing this capacity. The Amazon is called the lung of the world. The Amazon is also life, human life, for at least 11,000 years and today has 34 million people living in the area. Nearly 3 million are indigenous people who make up 420 different tribes, 86 languages, and 650 dialects. So almost 20% of the Amazon race forest has disappeared in the last half century. And this is accelerating since President Jair Bolsonaro took power in Brazil in early 2019, the rate of deforestation measured in July was nearly four times higher than the previous year. According to a satellite imaging, about 2,254 kilometers of Amazon rainforest were cut in July, and 278% increased over the previous year. Pope Francis, Francisco called last August for a global commitment to end fires and illegal destructive mining in the Amazon. As a Jesuit, as a Christian, and as a Venezuelan, I'm really hurt by the destruction of an area where so many people live, where life develops in its many forms, and from where nature gives life to the entire planet. If we are not able to stop the destruction that companies and people interested only in economic benefits are causing, the future of the generation, your, your children's generations, is also compromised. Poverty, illnesses, and migration are the most terrible consequences of that destruction. God is present in nature and tell us, here is my gift, the earth. You have to take care of it. You know, we believe by, my, by a misinterpretation of the book of Genesis that we own the planet and the whole universe. We are wrong. We need to change our mentality. We are part of this planet. We are not the owners, but we have an immense responsibility for the care and continuity of his creation. What will we do to work with all those who collaborate and give of their time from hundreds of organizations to stop the danger that threatens our future? Honestly, if we have come to this teaching and we still don't have connections with the reality that is lived in those lands and what we hear here does not move our hearts to work for it, if we just create new friendships here in the comfort of this hotel and we stay don't connect emotionally with those who have lost their homes and sources of life in the Amazon and other areas in the planet, we are not doing our job well. Ignatian spirituality and pedagogy, and pedagogy, sorry, call us to see God in all things and people. That is why I would like to point out five keys to act from now on in the care of our common home. Nuestra casa común, planet Earth, la tierra. Number one, we need to be new prophets of our time. We need not only to denounce what is wrong or contrary to human dignity, but we need to have a proposal to the world. That implies vision. Our proposal must be connected to people's needs. It is necessary to walk, to move, to know the world, that will give us more creativity. 
you young people are dynamic, and that is wonderful. Getting moving will, will fill you with images, ideas, and friends along the way. It will fill you with a radical hope for your prophetic action, as the motto of this meeting rightly stated. Two, we need to inform ourselves even more and better. We are called to put our intellect at the service of humanity. Having studied at a prestigious university only for our development does not make any sense if we do not strive to make, to make a better world. If we don't suffer and cry with those who suffer and cry, we must approach all knowledge to discern which develops and dignifies more. We do not lack resources. We have orientations and technology to go very far. We, the Jesuits, have been working for centuries with many lay and religious people from our educational, social, cultural, and technical platforms. Father General recently approved the preferential options of our missions. We can do, we can make this place a better place to live. The Pope had already published his encyclical from a study, our study for the care of the planet. Laudato Si is a proposal for new ecological dynamics that also face the destructive course that is approaching. And we need to know more and praise those crucial documents. Three, we need to live our Ignatian spirituality with a sense of reality. Our spirituality helps us to discern what God Guns, sorry, wants us to do with life, while other spiritualities seek the God of love, beauty, and forgiveness, ours seeks also the one who always works in the world and in each person to make us co-creators. And we need to believe that we are co-creators. We need to recognize that what we do make the kingdom of dignity, peace, justice, and respect possible in every human, human life. Four, we need to be contemplative in action because to contemplate is not only to look, but to enter into reality, which is not always holy, and to feel called to orders one who whole being for the sake of loving and serving all, including those who do not love us. In our spirituality, it is understood that his call supposes an immense desire for love of neighbors, which is not ethereal, but the desire to make, to make the life of the other more dignified. Five, we need to see our own life as, humanized, as a humanizing project. We are co-creators when our action is connected with what he wants of us. We need to know each other better we need to be better friends. We need to look for others who think and want to work with us. You know, sometimes I think that every time that we gather here, we are talking among the same people. We need to, to be stronger as friends, but we need to go out to talk to those who don't know this message. That is the challenge here. We need to ask ourselves, like Ignatius of Loyola, what, I, what have I done? what I do, and what will I do for Christ who is present in life, in the life of others? We need to discern what will be the best way to connect with this world and to go to the center of its problems and possibilities and to do everything as if it depended on me, knowing that God is absolutely present in it. We are in social networks online and in social spaces every day. May all this lead me to the search, to the recognition of the others, and to action for the good of everything, for the greater glory of God, at mayor and day gloriam, a la mayor gloria de Dios. It was not in vain that Francisco encourages us to start working from the Amazon with the Synod that has just ended. Francisco wants to know what, people, what the people of God thinks about the threats and difficulties for life, territory and culture, about the aspirations and inspirations and challenges of the Amazonian people in relations to the church and the world, 
what hope the presence of the church offers to the Amazonian communities for life, territory, and culture. Poverty, social division, poverty, violence, and exclusion. Almost all of them are still present in our places. That danger of the Amazon is not only down there, it's in the entire world. However, here we are at the largest conference of social justice in this country. Isn't this a powerful force? How many projects can emerge from these days here? How can we make our questions and ideas turn into a program of social reconstruction? It seems like, it, it seems like a long road, but the kingdom of God calls us to exercise a leadership that builds the care of this planet. The only one we have, every one of us is called to claim, not with violence, but with proposal and alliances, a happier, more dignified world for all for the next generations. Would it be what we that we have to wait for another generation? I don't think we have to. Will it be that this whole process of human renewal begins with you? That is my hope. As Chloe said yesterday, love is justice. And we need to put love in action with our faith, as we just heard five minutes ago. We need to be connected in many ways. We need to work together. If you don't have a program to participate in, after this meeting, go to know more programs and stay connected. That is my hope. And be, I believe that it is also God's hope you can't count on me. Tu cuentas conmigo. You can't count of us. And you can't count of many outside. Amen. To be witnesses of radical hope and prophetic love in our world and to our world. Our tradition calls us to pray for deeper unity, for God's desires for us and our brothers and sisters and for Mother Earth and to acknowledge the ways in which we are accountable for our common home. Using the examine, let us spend a few minutes to contemplate our actions for greater ecological conversion and steadfast vigilance for the marginalized. I invite you each into a space of quiet to listen to God. Close your eyes and let God stir you to radical hope and prophetic action. Begin in gratitude for our common good and all of creation. Where does creation sing to me? Where does creation sing to you? to the environment and to others. Are there ways in which I acted or didn't act that left a primary need or concern unfulfilled or unacknowledged?
God to surface within you. The deeper ways you can serve as an agent for our common home, as it relates to environmental justice, what are the micro and macro changes I can make in my lifestyle for ecological conversion? God to reveal to you the ways in which you can serve the marginalized, the vulnerable, and the exploited. What can I do for laborers and individuals who are expected, who are exposed because of resource demands of the global economy and climate change impacted in their communities? offer the things which you can forgo to support ecological justice and the dignity of laborers, individuals, families, and communities. What can I live without to show global solidarity to all who endure the impact of environment malfeasance? gratitude and openness to where God is calling you forth in radical hope and action for our common home of our brothers and, sis and sisters. Mindful that we are not perfect, Lord and the state of the environment to our collective responsibility and, dare I say, our collective social sin. We ask you, Lord, for pardon because our actions have led to us to put my good over our common good. We ask for pardon from sacred Mother Earth and the Great Spirit. This call to prayer is a vibration from generations of indigenous people who have long honored care for creation. Dona Yahipi, Kin, Iuha, Chante, Washtena, Fed, Shuzapikstov, 
Asichiati, Tyler Starkonga, Amachiati, Nalahala Komi Chajeki, Wambli Kiawi, Amachiati Kishto, Wanietu Maake, Shakpe, Na Machpia Luto, Awaiwa, Awa Blawa. Ehomi Daki B, Chante Washtena Pe, Chuspate, Raskanoir Hemacha Pelo, Lakowi Chajeki, Hehaka Luzaha Hemacha. We come here this morning to share a prayer with you and uh, we brought a drum and a sacred song to share with you for uh, awareness and strength and togetherness to pray for our Mother Earth and to, to make a prayer in a sacred way. So I ask that you join us in prayer as, as we sing these sacred songs at this time. and these re relational vibrations last night. We are all related to one another and to all of the earth. However, sometimes the road to caring for creation requires help and humility. So we ask the creator for pity and help. Um, this song translates to great spirit, have pity on me. Help me, have pity on me. Whatever is sacred, have pity on me. Help me, have pity on me. This song expresses to call upon the great spirit and support and guidance is being to, um, in being imperfectly human and recognizing these ways in which we've heard, hurt the earth and one another. Kunkashila, help us be aware and empathetic to the world's sufferings. This next song we will sing um, translates to grandfather, look at me. It is me standing here suffering. I stand for Grandmother Earth. I seek all that is peaceful and calm. <laughs> Oh! 
Akuyase. It means that we're all connected and we're all related. Ohecha tu. Thank you all for the opening prayer and for that song, those two songs, thank you. It's my pleasure to introduce a pair of Ignatian Network speakers, Emma Menchaca Chavez and Reggie Worles from Regis University. A love that is whole. Welcome. How do you sum up the relationship between God and queerness in five minutes? We don't know. <laughs> and quite honestly, we are not going to be able to do that. Rather, we would like to offer a glimpse into moments in our journey of exploring just that. Hello, I'm Reggie, and I use he, him, his pronouns. And I'm Emma, and I use she, her, her pronouns. We both go to Regis University and are involved with the social justice scene at our institution. We both study peace and justice, but I've decided to go on the less practical side and study po whoa, philosophy to expand my degree, <laughs> while Emma has decided to pursue politics. Our story of faith and queerness, two things that for us have wounds wrapped up together while still having the potential to heal us, has been a tenuous journey, and still, when I think about healing, I think of a process of becoming whole, both seeing myself as a whole person and being seen as whole by others. The message that we would like to share with you is a message of advocating for all of us to create a world that is better than our current one, and to do this through a whole love and genuine care for each other. If we take a good, hard look at the gospel, the Jesus that we see is someone who extends love to people who are suffering and marginalized. People who would have normally been erased, silenced, invisible, or hated were people who Jesus spent the most time with. He, he would, would have, have loved, loved the, the gays. gays. <laughs> if we truly want to live in Jesus' legacy, then we need to consider what the theme of this gathering offers us. To dream of a world where we can offer up a sense of love and compassion to people who we've once hated is a radical hope. And yet, it is a hope that Emma and I see ourselves working to make a reality. This is a prophetic action. Love is not just a feeling, but it manifests in the ways that we see each other, see each other's wholeness. This shows up in our experience, not only as queer people, but as queer people of color. We need a whole love one that requires truly engaging and building meaningful and intersectional community with others. This is what informed Reggie and I to host Ignatian Q. Ignatian Q brings together students representing most of the 27 Jesuit universities in the United States, among others, for a series of, of events that explore the LGBTQIA plus identity, identity within the context of Jesuit education. The theme for this year's conference is at the crossroads, staying, for, staying the course for a love that is whole. We think that we are at a crossroads of discernment within ourselves, within our church, and within our society. And we have decided that we have to decide what it means for us to be with and for others. Does it mean with and for others as long as they believe in what we believe? With and for others as long as they do what we would do? Our hope is that by hosting this conference at our university, we will allow both ourselves and people from other universities to explore what loving hopefully looks like. It is dangerous to be queer, to be different in our society. Our people have been targeted in city streets, at universities, in nightclubs, and just about any of the limited spaces we have to find community. And yet, we are here in spite of all of this fear praying and working towards a world with better systems and structures that offer care and equity to queer people. 
We are living in hope. We have been inspired to act. We are here because we believe that we must see each other in our wholeness, just as God would see us. There are so many queer people who have left the church, who have halted their relationship with God because of how they've been treated. A place that should be a site for community, encouragement, and deep love has been a site of pain and trauma. A whole world love works against this, recognizes the humanity in others, and slowly brings back life into our society that has been so broken by violence and hate. When I first arrived at Regis in 2016, I had the worries of so many college students during their first weeks of classes. I also worried about my safety, my ability to explore my identities, and my ability to create meaningful relationships. I looked around and saw very few opportunities to do any of this. It felt like I didn't belong, like I should have gone to a different school. It was like I knew that I could never belong to the community that I had chosen. Over time, I began to meet professors that taught about queerness in the classroom. I went to Ignatian Q and sat in a room full of people who were all asking similar questions to me. And then I started to use my own voice to advocate for changes. I began to ask questions of high level administrators. The answers were not always good. Sometimes they hurt. Sometimes they made me go back into my room and call my mom, begging her to let me come back home. She did not let me give up. She believed in me. So I waited a bit, and then every once in a while, I saw that those conversations I was having with administration were paying off. When our president came to our Queer Student Alliance's drag show, when our provost created a university-funded task force for exploring how we treat queer students, or when both our president and our provost stood up to the archdiocese and told them that they would stand with their queer students, period. For me, this discernment about my relationship with God came at a very young age. I had many questions about who this God person was, but my biggest question was, if God loved me, why would he make me gay in a society that was constantly sending me a message that it was a sin, that the way that I was born was a sin? But through the whole love I received from my mother after coming out for the second time, a woman of strong Catholic background growing up in Mexico, the love I felt at Regis University and hope I've gotten through the Jesuit values, I've been able to restore my faith and I believe justice is seeing each other in the wholeness and loving and advocating for each other's wholeness. Why would it be radical just to see someone as full and worthy of love? We think that it is because we live in a world that has taught us to be small and to not demand to be seen and to be loved. Our hope is that by sharing our message, by being vulnerable and honest with you, that you can begin the process of seeing and loving, not just queer people, but all of us who are marginalized into wholeness. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for those beautiful and guiding words. Please welcome to the stage Danny Gustafson of Boston College and the Jesuit Post speaking on the incarnation, why and how to be civically engaged. How does God see the world? What does God think about politics or civic engagement? In the spiritual exercises, St. Ignatius of Loyola includes a prayer exercise in which the person imagines being with the Trinity, looking at the world, seeing humanity with all of their struggles, joys, challenges, and hopes. And in the midst of this whole variety of human experiences, the Trinity decides to send one of themselves to Earth 
to work for the redemption of the human race. God saw, God sees what is going on in the world. And how does God respond? By choosing to get involved by, as fully human in Jesus Christ. God chose, God chooses to get involved. Our world is certainly still full of struggles, joys, challenges, and hopes. Honestly, sometimes it's easier to focus on these struggles and challenges, the darkness, the brokenness. I read the news each morning and read accounts of children in cages, cities plagued by violence, mass shootings, hate crimes, all varieties of discrimination, and so very many human lives being treated as disposable or inconvenient. But that's not all I see. And more importantly, that's not all that God sees. I also see all of us gathered here this weekend. And so what are we to do in the face of the profound challenges and struggles in the world around us? What does it mean to be faithfully, civically engaged at our point in history? A fundamental truth of democracy is that decisions are made by those who show up. If you want to see change, you need to show up. For those who are able, Vote. You must vote. No excuses, no qualifiers. Vote. But I know some of you here can't vote, but you still have a ton to offer to our civic life. So how do you, how do all of us, engage that? As people immersed in the Ignatian tradition, our guiding principle must always be to return to the person of Jesus Christ. What did he do when faced with challenges, with chaos, with the reality of our beautiful and broken world? He got involved. But how so? First, he prayed. Now, I know what some of you may be thinking. Seeing politicians tweet, sending thoughts and prayers in the wake of an utterly preventable atrocity is insufficient and unsatisfying, to say the very least. But Jesus took time to pray for himself, for his community, and for the coming of the kingdom of God where peace and justice reign. As people of faith, we should not discount the importance of prayer. One of my favorite quotations about prayer is from from Pope Francis. He says, you pray for the hungry and then you feed them. That's how prayer works. And I think that's a good model for us. Do we take time to pray for for our local, national, and global communities? And then, do we take action? Second, Jesus wasn't afraid of having conversations with people who disagreed with him. So many of the political and religious authorities of his time thought he was some combination of threatening, crazy, and flat-out wrong. But rather than blocking them on Twitter, he engaged them in conversation. That doesn't mean he backed down from his views or said these authorities were very fine people but he stayed engaged for those hard conversations. So what does it mean for us to imitate Jesus in this way? First, be informed of what's going on. Read the news, both the good and the bad. There's no way of knowing how to respond if you don't know what's going on in the first place. This can be easy. Follow different news sources and journalists on social media. Find a good news podcast. Next, Talk to your friends and family, your teachers, your classmates, your neighbors. Ask what they think about current events. Listen to their answers. And if you disagree, can you find some small bit of common ground and build from there? When I was in high school and first starting to get interested in politics, a family friend told me that he never voted, that he didn't think he knew enough about what was going on in the world and didn't think his vote really mattered. I've never been terribly shy about sharing my opinions, so. I told him if he wasn't going to bother casting a vote, I would be very happy to give him a list of candidates to go in and vote for on my behalf. (laughs) To this day, whenever I'm back home visiting family, I see him every now and then, and he says that ever since I said that, he has voted in almost every single election. And there's nothing heroic or profound in what I did, but sometimes just a little word of encouragement can help people get more engaged. Third. And I think this point is particularly relevant for us here. Jesus never stopped working to build a more inclusive community. Everyone was welcome with Jesus. Fishermen, tax collectors, prostitutes, Jews, Samaritans, Greeks, even the authorities he debated with. When Jesus saw someone who was on the margins of society, 
he sought to welcome them back into the community by healing them, forgiving them, or simply showing that they too were worthy of dignity and inclusion. So how do we promote that same dignity and inclusion in our own civic engagement? For me, the first question to ask is who I'm leaving out, who I'm excluding, whose voice I don't hear, whose voice I don't want to hear. This can be as concrete as looking at who we spend our time with. Do I hang out only with people who look and think like me? And these same questions can apply more broadly to how we engage current events in politics. Finally, be patient and stay hopeful. When I see some of the things our government is doing, I get so frustrated, I feel like I could pull out what's left of my hair. But <laughs> government isn't the devil. Politics isn't a broken, dirty process and getting involved in our shared civic life is anything but a waste of time. Many good, decent, holy people spend huge parts of their lives working through these institutions, trying to make the world a better place. And I believe that God is working through them too. In the incarnation, God saw what was, what is going on in our world, the joys and the heartbreaks, the challenges and the opportunities. And what does God choose to do in response to all of this? God gets involved. We too can see endless hopes, fears, successes, and failures in our world. And what should we choose to do in response to all of this? God chooses to get involved. And so we too must choose to get involved. Here now to help us get a little more involved in immigration policy is Joanna Williams. Joanna has been the Director of Education and Advocacy at the Kino Border Initiative in Nogales, Arizona and Sonora since 2015. She graduated with a Bachelor of Science from the School of Foreign Service at Georgetown and received a Master's in Public Policy from Arizona State University. Prior to her current position, she journeyed with immigrants in a variety of contexts. She volunteered at a shelter in Tierra Blanca, Veracruz, conducted Fulbright research on the reintegration of deported and returned migrants, and worked as a coordinator for the American Civil Liberties Union Border Litigation Project. Please welcome Joanna Williams. I can't think of a more appropriate and more humbling moment to stand here before you. What a powerful and prophetic week. Not only are we commemorating the anniversary, the 30th anniversary of the martyrs in El Salvador, but just to give a short list, we here have stood on Tuesday with, I don't know how to change the slide, somebody could change to the next slide. We as an Ignatian community have stood together on Tuesday with the young people who are defending their right to DACA before the Supreme Court. Perhaps less noticed, we also stood with the family of Sergio Hernandez Guereca, who was killed by Border Patrol agents at the U.S.-Mexico border, and who also went to court that day, whose family also went to court on Tuesday. We stand this coming week in the week of action to save asylum. So together as a community, this has been a moment in which for me personally, I've been able to reflect on the immigrants who've inspired me in my journey, who've inspired me to advocacy. So reflecting this week many, on, the, on an event many years ago in 2006, when my undocumented classmate, Anayeli, together with many other people in my high school, walked out of class in order to protest the criminalization of immigrants in this country. I'm ashamed to say that I didn't join her that day. That my nerves about breaking the rules or making waves kept me in my seat. That Anayeli risked her life and her safety, and I couldn't even risk an unexcused absence. I can't get that day back. But what I can do is stand with Anayeli and defend her right to stay here defend her right to continue to work as a public school teacher in the very same school district where we studied together. Defend her right
to recognize that home is here. I also stand here today with Juan Carlos, who many of you heard from last night, who for four years fought in, within his own justice system in Honduras to try to have some reparation, some justice, and who was unable to overcome that corruption. So for eight months fought from within immigration detention in the United States for recognition of the persecution that he was fleeing. And now that he's won asylum, he continues to fight for his brothers and sisters who continue to be in detention, for others who continue to seek asylum. And in a very special way today, I stand with Anayi. Anayi is a transgender woman who fled Honduras because of persecution based on her gender identity. She suffered for months in Mexico, violence because of her identity as she was stranded on the Mexican side of the border. Once she was in detention in the United States in Eloy Detention Center, she suffered insults, assaults, harassment because of her gender identity, and the guards were unwilling to protect her and instead participated in the harassment. Anai was still in detention when she chose to speak up and go public with her story, knowing very well that she could suffer reprisals from the very guards that were meant to protect her. Last week, Anai won her asylum case. Just four days later, I saw Anai at this press conference joining Scott Warren, who's, who's being prosecuted this week for giving humanitarian aid to migrants in the desert. Four days after winning her asylum case, Anai said to me, my own experience has taught me the importance of defending rights. So I'm here, I want to stay here because I want to be a part of this community of activists. That's our invitation tomorrow when we go to the Hill. We stand on the shoulders of giants and we stand in the company of giants as we journey to the hill tomorrow. If I can get the next slide. Tomorrow, what we want to tell our senators and representatives is that home is here. We must pass a Clean Dream Act. We cannot wait for the Supreme Court to throw our classmates' lives into turmoil, to cause people to lose their work permits, to create further insecurity. We must create a pathway to citizenship for young people in our country now. We must create a pathway to citizenship for young people like Anayeli. And this means not just protecting the 700,000 people who have DACA, but also the 1.4 million young people who've been excluded to DACA from DACA because they were either too old or too young. So when you visit your Senate offices tomorrow, tell them the House has already passed a bill. We need you to pass S-874, the Dream Act of 2019. And while you're at it, when you visit your House members, if they voted yes on the Dream and Promise Act, thank them for their vote. Ultimately, what we, we want and what we must insist on in these Senate offices and the House offices is a clean Dream Act. That means a Dream Act that protects our young people without persecuting other people, without putting people like Juan Carlos and Anaí in further difficulty, without persecuting Anayeli's parents. That's the kind of dream act that we want, a clean dream act that doesn't trade others' well-being for that of dreamers. Let me hit the next slide. We also, tomorrow, will journey into the beginning of a week of action to save asylum. Among the many policies that are affecting asylum seekers, one that particularly concerns us is a policy named Remain in Mexico. Under Remain in Mexico, instead of people being able to be in the United States in detention or released when they're seeking their asylum, when they're going through their immigration court process, they're returned to Mexico to wait for their asylum case. People like Juana, Carlos and Anaí are now being forced into homelessness and danger in northern Mexican cities instead of being received by families and communities within the United States. Over 55,000 people have already been subject to this policy. And Congress doesn't care because they aren't hearing it from their constituents. They heard from their constituents when our government separated thousands of children from their parents. But they haven't heard from their constituents that we care about people who are being forced into homelessness in Mexico. So you have the opportunity to stand with people like Anaí and Juan Carlos and tell your congressional representatives and senators we had an asylum system. 
We had an asylum system that evaluated claims and determined protection, and the Trump administration has systematically dismantled this system. <laughs> Congress must take action to defund the Remain in Mexico program and hold the Department of Homeland Security accountable. We're able to say this in an incredible way because we know from the Ignatian community what it looks like to offer hospitality. We know the power of welcoming families and individuals seeking asylum into our communities, the way that that grows us as a community, and the capacity that we have to receive more people. So tell Congress to allow us to exercise our religious freedom. Allow us to exercise our faith and to welcome asylum seekers instead of forcing them back into Mexico and back to Central America. So I've been on the Hill all week. I've been, I flew out to DC on Tuesday after going to the press conference for Scott Warren. And if I can get the next slide, lovely. I've been on the Hill all week and the most discouraging thing that I hear sometimes in offices is offices that feel overwhelmed. Representatives and senators who are throwing up their hands and saying, with this administration, we just can't do anything. You all need to walk into those offices tomorrow and remind your senators and representatives that they have power and you expect them to use that power. <laughs> remind Congress that it has the power of the purse that then when they negotiate funding agreements, which they're in the process of negotiating this week, tell them that we don't want them to increase funding for immigration enforcement. We don't want more agents on our streets who are able to do raids, who are detaining our families, who are uh, abusing people at the border. We don't want them to give more funds to remain in Mexico. We don't want more of our taxpayer dollars going to holding people in homelessness in Mexico. And ultimately, we want Congress to reclaim its power of the purse, to put clear guidelines on how the administration can use the money, instead of allowing the Trump administration to steal money from different pots of government in order to fund their enforcement programs. Tell Congress to reassert its power as a branch of government. And it's particularly important for you when you walk into Republican offices tomorrow to, remind, to encourage them to make public statements in support of asylum seekers. I've heard privately in offices that people say, well, we support asylum seekers. We understand the consequences of what's happening. But the Republicans aren't saying it publicly. The Repu there used to be bipartisan support for refugees and asylum seekers in this country. And I believe that in the hearts of people there still is. What we need to do is to tell, when a, an office tells you, we support the vulnerable individuals, tell them to say that publicly, not just in a meeting, but on a platform, on a stage, to the media. So we need those voices to be heard. If I can get the next slide, please. So if you remember nothing else about this policy briefing, remember that we stand in the, on the shoulders of and in the company of giants as we insist tomorrow that home is here and we must save asylum. Let's say that together. Home is here, save asylum. What are we telling Congress tomorrow? Home is here, save asylum. Thank you. Whoa, whoa. All right, family, so we're going to actually ask you to stand up, stretch out a little bit. And for this, one, two, this one, song two. right here, we're going to ask you to flex your Spanglish muscles. So the lyrics go like this. Repeat after me. Oye, mi gente, traemos la fuerza. Oye, mi gente, traemos la fuerza. So that means, listen up, my people, we bring the strength. La libertad es mi única bandera. Liberation for all is my only flag. Rise up, my people, my condors, my eagles. Rise up, my people, my condors, my eagles. And that's speaking to the indigenous prophecy of people from Turtle Island and these two continents coming together. And we've seen that, we've seen that at Standing Rock. We're seeing that at Mauna Kea. We're seeing that all over, following indigenous leadership. And the last line, 
real powerful, real strong, with all your spirit, with all your heart. No human being will ever be illegal. Yes, family, so you're going to get that real quick. Here we go. Eso. Oye, mi gente, traemos la fuerza. La libertad es mi única bandera. Rise my people, my condo is my eagles. No human being will ever be. Oye, mi gente, traemos la fuerza. La libertad es mi única bandera. Paso my people, my condos, my eagles. No human being will ever be illegal. Hay una sola raza, familia humana Me apacho mamá, canto yo, escucho sus palabras Ella dice basta, no a la matanza Carmen y mis hijos, fiesta de mañana Mi esperanza vive en los ojos de chiquito El otro mundo es posible Ya está escrito, like the San Patricio Fighting for the Mexicans, forget a flag Freedom what I represent Que el pueblo se levante Levante Era para todos en ese instante Bobo ni ciego, veo el elefante Por eso pa'lante Siempre pa'lante Forward, we know fear of a border we know racism, racism is a disorder. Same master up on the corner. Leading us to the slaughter. The corner is someone illegal. illegal. Stupid is only what I say. Hey, oye, mi gente, traemos la fuerza. La libertad es mi única bandera. Cross of my people, my condos, my egos. No human being will ever be legal. We say no. No ban and no Say that with us. We, we say, say no. No ban and no wall. We say no, no, no. What? No ban and no wall. We say no, no, no. No ban and no wall. Oh yeah, we say oh yeah. Mi gente traemos la fuerza. La libertad es mi única bandera. Rise up, my people, my condos, my eagles. No human being will ever be. They rise up. Rise up, my people, my condos, my eagles. No human being will ever be illegal. Thank you. You can have a seat. Thank you, Peace Poets and Francisco. Now it's my honor to introduce our next keynote, Dr. Marsha Chatlin. Marsha Chatlin is a Provost Distinguished Associate Professor of History and African American Studies at Georgetown University in Washington, DC. Previously, she was a Reach for Excellence Assistant Professor of Honors in African American Studies at the University of Oklahoma. She is a graduate of St. Ignatius College Prep the University of Missouri Columbia with a BA in Journalism Religious Studies and Brown University AM and PhD in American Civilization. Her first book, Southside Girls Growing Up in the Great Migration, reimagined the mass exodus of black Southerners to the urban North from the perspective of girls and teenage women. Her latest book, Franchise, The Golden Arches in Black America, examines the intersection of the post 1968 civil rights struggle and the rise of the fast food industry. Her next book will examine the history of college access programs and the specific ways that first generation college students are transforming higher education. Chatlin contributed to the Atlantic, Time, the Washington Post, the Chronicle of Higher Education, and the podcast Undisclosed serving as the resident historian on a narrative arc about the 2015 death of Freddie Gray while in the custody of the Baltimore Police Department. Chatlin has received awards and honors from the Ford Foundation, the American Association of University Women, and the German Marshall Fund of the United States. At Georgetown, she has won several teaching awards. In 2016, the Chronicle of Higher Education named her a top influencer in academia and recognition of her social media campaign, hashtag Ferguson Syllabus, which implored educators to facilitate discussions about the crisis in Ferguson, Missouri in 2014, 
please welcome Dr. Marsha Chatlin. Hi folks, how's everyone doing? I feel like there's nothing left. This morning has been so powerful. Um, as someone who went to Catholic school her whole life, I feel like this is like a Kairos retreat. This is the best assembly you've ever been to. Um, is there a clicker up here? I don't see it. I don't think it's here. Anyway, but let's have some fun anyway. Um, I was asked to do this um, speaking opportunity uh, maybe nine months ago. Sometimes they contact you so early. And so you spend the whole time thinking, what is there left to say? Like, what can you say to a group of people who are not only immersed in so many thoughtful reflections about who we are in the world, but at a gathering like this, thank you so much, um, at a gathering like this, when you cover so many topics. And so I think since I've been invited to come here, I have been on the lookout of what I want to talk about and what I want to share with you. I think sometimes it's hard when you're in an environment where the energy of justice is so strong. And as an individual, you think to yourself, am I as powerful as this entire community? Who am I? Um, you know, tomorrow some of you will go, on the, uh, go to Congress and be super aggressive and stand for yourself, and there's some of you who will be so freaked out you can't say a word. And I want us to think about all of the gifts we have to make a difference, because for every um, amazing speaker like Joanna, for every person who is going to stage that walkout or develop that beautiful protest song, there is the person who, through their quieter gifts, are also part of the process. And so what I decided to talk about today was something that I saw on Twitter. And unfortunately, most of my best material comes from Twitter, but <laughs> please forgive me. In April of 2017, Liddell Lee was executed by the state of Arkansas. In the public notice about the state's action against a human being, the prison spokesperson reported that Mr. Lee refused the traditional last meal offered death row inmates, and he instead received the sacrament of the Eucharist. The last meal is probably one of the most bizarre rituals of the gruesome practice of the death penalty. In providing a comfort or indulgence before someone is marched to their death, often a reluctant, anxiety-filled, fearful end of life, the public can be distracted from the realities of the conditions of prisons and the brutality of the death penalty with these stories. Sometimes the news will cover requests for lobsters and steaks, buckets of Kentucky Fried Chicken, a single olive, or a pot of black coffee. These are ways to talk about inmates receiving too much mercy as they fulfill their sentence, or sometimes they're considered interesting or bizarre fun facts in true crime stories of unrepentant and eccentric serial killers. But in the case of the death sentence delivered to Liddell Lee, and in other situations where the Eucharist was sought before dying, his choice of Holy Communion is perhaps one of the greatest acts of radical hope I have ever heard. His choice of the Eucharist and its interpretation as a refusal of the state's idea of what the last meal should be provides us a powerful way of examining faith in a world that tries to make us see each other and ourselves in our worst ways. Did Mr. Lee actually refuse a last meal? Did he say no to sustenance? Or did his radical hope propel him, as our Catholic tradition has taught us, to receive the most nourishing and most satisfying of last meals. The story of Liddell Lee and the subsequent reports about the malfeasance in his arrest and prosecution, including the possibility he was represented by an intoxicated attorney, stuck me in my gut when I first read about it via the Twitter feed of Sister Helen Prejean, the Catholic nun who has led Catholics to consciousness about not only the death penalty, but also about the racism rooted in the nation's criminal justice system. As someone who had my first communion, I think in second or third grade, I can't remember that far, I'm a lot older than I look, um, and who has taken part in the mass hundreds if not thousands of times over 30 years, I never understood the radical hope of the Eucharist until Sister Helen shared the story 
of a man that the state of Arkansas determined so vile and beyond reproach for breaches to the social contract that his extermination was the only response. Mr. Lee did not choose to utter any last words, so I may be projecting my own search for radical hope in his decision, but I'm grateful for his gift. In this year, we celebrate the martyrs of El Salvador. As a Catholic young person and teenager, I was told stories of the martyrs of centuries past. But to think of martyrs alive at the same time as me, sharing the same world, real live martyrs whose pictures were in color, like the pictures we took at my first communion, I grew fascinated by people of faith in my own time. Like many Catholic school children in the 1980s and 1990s, we watched the films about the life and death of Jean Donovan, Maura Clark, and now Saint Oscar Romero. Do they still show Romero in school too? Okay, so some things haven't changed. In these dramatic interpretations of martyrdom, the nuns and priests and lay people who served the people of El Salvador emanated grace, and although they struggled in their faith, were people I imagined worth the admiration given to martyrs. Yet, Liddell Lee, someone who will not be considered a martyr, his refusal of his last meal, of his acceptance of the great meal of faith, reignited that same feeling I had as a youth, to think about the, my own refusals and my own spiritual hunger and the choices I have made or refuse to make in the interest of the greater good. So what does it mean for us to believe that our professed faith the traditions of the church is the best way to commemorate and honor the end of our own journeys on earth. Our final suppers will be the last taste of what the secular and earthly world has to offer, or will it be the radical hope of the Eucharist? When called to select our last meals, our last suppers, do we imagine our faith being so strong that we refuse the decadence of a lobster, of the artificial sweetness of candy, and simply savor the last taste of our radical hope on earth. I don't know if I could make such a choice or would make such a choice. I don't know if it would occur to me in a moment of fear and hopelessness to turn toward my faith and not away from it. But in reading Lee's story and learning about the various artists who have worked to paint pictures like the ones I'll show you shortly, it gives me a lot to think about. Photographer Henny Henry Hargraves said of this series called No Seconds, it was inspired by the state of Texas's attempt to end the last meal tradition. That creating photographs of these meals because he has, quote, always been fascinated by the mix of the mundane and the extraordinary in the most unnatural moment that there is, state-sponsored death. What kind of requests for food have been made? So he recreates these last meals as they would be enjoyed by one of us here today, in takeout cartons with proper silverware. And the fact that this is a meal that was enjoyed by someone who had been labeled a criminal and irredeemable on a list along with the details of the meal, Hargreaves forces us to think about what does it mean for us to make mundane these practices of the state? Practices we may disagree with, but uh, that are ultimately done in our names. Ronnie Lee Garner's last meal included his enjoying the Lord of the Rings trilogy before he was put to death before a firing squad, a practice that is still legal as a primary or backup method in two other states. The cheery but muted colors of these photographs can convince us that our meals enjoyed in community, around a table with friends, but the details, the small details, like this one, of Teresa Lewis's execution, she is among 1% of women who have been killed by the state, reminds us that the photograph and the photographer added the tablecloth and the matching china. Julia Ziegler Haynes has also commemorated people's last meals. She creates sculptures and then takes photographs in a series called Today's Special, and they comprise 24 images of the foods delivered to death row inmates. This request from, 20, uh, from 2007 has been captured by Ziegler Haynes, as well as another artist who uses painted pottery, pottery to commemorate these meals. 
Julie Green titled this piece, Pizza and Birthday Cake, shared with 15 family and friends. A prison official said, he told us he had never had a birthday cake, so we ordered a birthday cake for him. Green also has these pieces in her collection, entitled Exonerated, for the people who have been able to receive the support necessary to get off death row and enjoy their first meal after learning that their death sentences were voided. I show this to you because we think about our gifts. I'm sure there are many talented artists here who in their contribution to this question of justice can bring people closer to a set of ideas in ways that great speeches and great campaigns can also do. So I remind us always to focus on the ways that we can use these gifts to interpret the urgency of the issues that are important to us. As a historian of fast food and a member of an organization that tries to approach the problem of hunger with a somewhat radical approach, do we have any people from Campus Kitchens? Yay, good to hear. <laughs> Um, I've been thinking a lot about who we are and what we consume. I'm thinking about the choices we savor at the end, not only of our lives, but the end of the milestones of our lives. What do we care to remember, to savor, to choose at our time in high school, in college? During your next visit home to see family and friends, what will you take back from that moment? And since we are here as a solidarity network, what do we imagine our last acts of justice will be at the end of our days? Before we go to sleep each night, when we examine how we spent our time, what will be our last act as people in solidarity with those who struggle, as people in struggle with those who suffer, and as people who choose radical hope? One of the great privileges and burdens many of us face is that of choice. We have so many choices. We can choose what we learn about, what we resist. We choose our relationships, how we spend our time. We choose and we choose and we choose. And we bask in our options and we're overwhelmed by them. And we still have to choose. And there are some choices that our world makes us believe can't be made, can't be logical and can't be real. We live in a world that says we have no choice but to segregate our schools. We have no choice to ignore the marginalized, no choice but to pursue what is financially rich rather than morally resplendent. That we have no choice to be merciful at the expense of someone else's misery. Most, if not all of us here, will never have to make the choice Liddell Lee made. But thinking about every day, we have the capacity to decline the empty fuel of the world for the true nourishment of our spiritual and social conviction. So over the past few years, I've been a lot of places. I've been on the road about 30 to 40 times a year, spending time at Catholic schools like the ones I attended, churches like the ones I experienced my sacraments, community groups that nurture the radical hope of their members, and college campuses filled with earnest, justice-loving students like yourselves, and I teach many wonderful students like Joanna at Georgetown University. And every place I go, people are concerned about the same things. The pervasive issues that concern people of faith and people of conscience, racism in our schools, police brutality and misconduct, the terrifying consequences of the 2016 election, and the pervasive legacy of slavery in the US, especially at universities like the one I work at and among Catholic communities. I've discovered that at every place I go, people are struggling with various levels of feeling powerless. When they are advantaged by their gender, their race, their educational background, their faith, and their wealth. People who are descendants of the enslaved have few avenues to fully articulate the pain of generations that has become part of their own pain. The descendants of slaveholders, including many American Catholics, are connected to the people who cause so much pain and they sometimes are forced to confront the fact that their power is indeed empty and they know that confronting the roots of it would alienate them from their own families and communities. How do we make these choices? What can we choose? I think about the choices put in front of all of us who seek to do justice and we seek mercy for ourselves and others. As a historian, I often take to my books for the great heroes 
of moments past for inspiration. I read about the radical response of Rosa Parks to the epidemic of sexual violence in the South that terrified black women and girls. I sometimes log into YouTube, this is like the only good thing on YouTube, and listen to the great speeches of Martin Luther King Jr., who's dying his short life understood that he may be indulging in his very last meal because his crusade for justice was always met with threats of violence. I listened to the music of Nina Simone and deliberate on her desperate hope when she sang, I wish I knew how it would feel to be free. I have to admit, and I, I think my mom is looking at this at live stream, she might not, um, but I never look at the Bible. <laughs> the Bible is usually last on the list of texts um, that I look to for inspiration, but over the years, after hearing testimony after testimony about the struggle to do what is right, or even know what is right, I have found myself turning to scripture and the life of Jesus, who many of us have been taught was the greatest radical hoper of his time. Jesus' example helps, helps us understand not just love and action, but the radical refusal to say no to the idea that injustice, cruelty, and desertion are just consequences of life. In talking to groups about the legacies and the afterlives of slavery, Jim Crow segregation, and racial terror in our lives, I often recall the story of the New Testament, when Jesus is in the depths of his hunger, his exhaustion, in his preparation for his march towards a death penalty of sorts, towards state-sanctioned death. So the devil presents himself in front of Jesus with a series of tests of faith. After 40 days and nights of fasting, the devil demands that Jesus turn stones into bread. He refuses. He directs Jesus to throw himself off a high point to test his faith in God. Jesus refuses. Then the most relatable of all moments in the scripture happens to Jesus. Matthew tells us, again the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Upon that point about the great kingdoms, the devil asks Jesus to renounce God, your creator, the peace and love of the world, for not only earthly wishes, but also for the fantasy that there are no choices, but inevitable arrangements that lead to and fuel empty power. The choice to renounce, the choice to say no to the devil's bargains, to renounce racism in favor of love, to renounce sexism and homophobia in order to choose radical acceptance, to renounce the empty wealth of seeking money and power instead of the wealth of the spirit, we are forced to make these choices every day in who we say hello to and where we avert our eyes, in who we welcome at our tables and who we repel in what we purchase and what we abstain from consuming. The devil and what the devil represents in this story is not the character of movies that haunt our houses and keep our imaginations up all night. We fear the devil as it's presented to us in popular culture. I am not a theological expert, nor do I proclaim to be, so I cannot confirm or deny the existence of the devil, like in the movies, but over the years, Hearing from people whose families have grieved the loss of loved ones at the hands of the state, of racists, of intimate partners, of indifferent strangers, people who have been stripped of their humanity in the search for relief across borders, I've discovered that what Jesus encountered in the wilderness and what was called Satan is a more frightening presence than any silver screen devil. The antithesis of Jesus' commitment to love and wholeness are the devil's manifestations in our time and it's strangely soothing and easy. It comes, in alive of the, it comes alive in the quiet work of keeping kids away from clean drinking water in Flint. It keeps homes full of lead in Baltimore and drives the price of affordable housing outside the reach of working people in DC. It muffles the cries of the terrorism at our nation's borders, and it mutes the cries that accompany the process of eating one's own last meal delivered on death row. As Jesus confronts, all this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. We are offered that each and every day in our lives. And our potential to radically refuse 
these small bargains is the beginning of how we rebuild our radical hope. We can get scared. We are sometimes rejected for doing what is right, persecuted for being different. So with a clear vision of the world we wish to see and a heart afraid of a world alone, we flinch. We choose a secure path. In my years talking to students and educators alike about confronting bias, racism, and other forms of hate, I try to understand how these forms of hatred have their own comforts. Like Jesus' temptation in the desert, Satan, our society's cruelties, are not unattractive or uncomfortable. Rather, they are deeply attractive. They allow us to be in community sometimes with our families, our friends, our schoolmates, our churches, and our political parties. If racism or ignoring poverty is the price you have to pay, then why not? Belonging is a fundamentally human impulse, yet we preserve our humanity in our capacity to find more spiritually nutritious sources of life. Radical hope isn't just about what we desire, what we hope for without limits. Radical hope is also about what we choose in order to honor our hope and the hope of others. Thank you. This is my mother's favorite story. When I was five years old, my uncle asked me what I wanted to be when I grew up. I took a second, thought about it, and said, I want to be a mommy. And just like that, he laughed at me, didn't think that I understood what he was asking me, but I did. Because even while other kids wanted to be ballers and doctors, I never saw those guys pick me up from school to make me pot roast or pasta. Meanwhile, my mother was for me what Holly Selassie is to Rastas, made more change in my life than everybody and Obama. She was my hallelujah and Hosanna. So this right here is from my mom. <laughs> you probably didn't notice you were teaching me to protest but you were. You gave me the fearlessness that's followed me from Palestine to Albany with fistfuls of humility to treat this life with fragility. The freedom song that's filling me, that's just the lullaby you used to sing to me that taught me no one should have to live through nightmares. And that lesson has become the root of my profession. So tonight I'm celebrating all the women who taught us to fight for human rights. articulating Article 1 by welcoming us into this life. You see, my mother's the personification of the ideal United Nations, actually loves everybody with equal dignity and patience, which is why I'm so passionate about Article 2, freedom from discrimination. You see, she had love like the sun had light, so I had Article 25's food and a place to sleep at night. Plus, I was always that kid breaking up fights because her compassion taught me freedom from persecution. She is why... I don't believe in execution. And her encouragement for the way that I write, that's just the way she chose to cite Article 27. It says, art and culture is a human right. Thank you, because now my job is bringing poetry to war zones from Haiti to Juarez to Beirut to Brooklyn where our people are overflowing in prisons full of hurt. My mother just went back to school to study social work. exercising her right to education. She is my universal declaration. And the only reason I studied politics and economics is because they didn't have a degree in motherhood. <laughs> but they should. And there should be required courses for everybody in the armed forces that teach no mother's child should be tortured. So close those secret prisons down.
and no mother's child should go hungry, so we want international debt relief now. You see, we all gotta keep it a lot more moms if our government dropping bombs. Get out in these streets like any mama would if you threaten her child's peace. I still wanna be a mommy, so you can tell the government not to draft me, because I got kids who are both American and Iraqi. And you best believe that a mother loves a child no matter where he's born, which is why I'm in these streets for immigration reform, telling Congress and the President we want legalization now. This is the only way I know how to say thank you to my mother. I am the child that you fostered with care in the form of wisdom shared. And just by being there, I'd be rich if I had a dime for every time you told me to cut my hair. <laughs> but in savings, I am poor because I always send my money back to Ecuador so there could be just a little more food on the plates where hunger often waits. You taught me never hesitate to give. So this is how I live. If my income can become bread, it will and stay. Ew. When it comes to love, I can never fill your shoes. But remember, <clears throat> yo, every step I take will be to prove you taught me well, ma. I know it's hard when I go away sometimes. I know you miss your baby and worry about my safety. But remember, I only do what I do because when I grow up, I want to be like you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank y'all so much.